Good morning, students. Welcome to Commutative Algebra Lectures. In this lecture, we will see ring of fractions and their properties. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, what is meant by ring of fractions? We have already something called what is meant by field of fractions. <clears throat> so, suppose take A is an integral domain. Okay. Say just uh, to understand, say suppose say Z. Okay. Then we have uh, we can construct a field of fractions. So this uh, I can call it simply FF, which is nothing but by taking uh, uh, elements of the form R L E in this way. R you can write by A by S. Okay, where obviously uh, they are like equivalence classes, where two equivalence element two elements are equivalent if A comma S is equivalent to B comma T, if and only if A T minus B S should be equal to zero. Okay, but if A is not an integral domain, if it is just a ring, then uh, similar to just like field of fractions, we have something called ring of fractions. Okay, so we'll see that what is meant by saying. Uh, obviously, it is a generalization of uh, field of fractions, right? Okay, so how we can define? You take A, which is any ring, of course, commuted to ring with unity. Then you take S, a subset of A. We say that it is a multiplicatively closed subset if so MCS means multiplicatively closed subset if it should contain one and whenever two elements are there, it should be closed with respect to multiplication. If these two conditions are satisfied, then we say it is a multiplicatively closed subset. Okay. Now take the Cartesian product A times S, okay, an element of A and an element of S. Then on this one, we can define a relation A comma S is equal to B comma T if and only if there exists some S, an element, uh, S is there already, so you use U, okay. So there exists some U such that A times B S, if this is not 0, but at least after multiplying, it should be 0, okay. So this is the difference between a field of uh, integral domain and this ring of fractions what we are considering uh, when A is any general ring, okay, fine. Obviously, uh, you can see that if your given ring is, um, if your given ring and this is non-zero element, this is non-zero element actually. So if your given ring is integral domain, then this one, because U is non-zero, so it has to be zero, okay, right, okay. Now you can e easily check that it is an equivalence relation. So consider you denote this as uh, equivalence classes of this a, a comma s, okay? <clears throat> and s inverse a you denote such different equivalence classes a by s, so where a is in a and s is in s, okay? And uh, on this set we can have two operations ring up. We can define a ring uh, operations. So if you take a by s plus b by t, obviously this is same as a t plus b s. Upon st, you can check that this belongs to s inverse a, okay, and a by s and b by t is a b by st, okay. So easily one can check that with respect to these two operations, this s inverse a is a ring, okay, that is called as ring of fractions of a, okay, with respect to that set s, right? Because if you change s, then s inverse a will change, right? And this is actually also called as localization of that ring at this set s. So whatever elements coming from that, yes, we are uh, actually able to invert those things, right? Let's see some examples uh, or some remarks. See, if you take A is an integral domain, suppose if this is an integral domain, then obviously you take S as all non-zero elements, right? Then you can check that S inverse A is nothing but the field of fractions of A, right? So it is same as the above one, right? Oh. So now, uh, we always have a uh, ring homomorphism for this A and S inverse A. So obviously, what should be this uh, map? Map you can send A f of A as A by one because S contains one, right? Uh, one can observe that this need not be injective. Okay, so if f of A is zero, that means if this is zero, it is not necessary that A should be equal to zero. A times something is zero, right? So this need not be injective. Just keep that, right? 
Now this S inverse A has uh, something called universal property when we have seen uh, discussion about mode um, tensor product, right? So what is that one? It says that if we have a map G, okay, from A to B, which is a ring homomorphism, such that such that if you take any element in S, then G of S should be a unit. So G of S is unit for every S in S, right? Then there exists, and we already have from A to S inverse A, this is our F, okay? Then uh, if under this condition G of S is unit, then there exists a unique ring homomorphism H from S inverse A to B, okay, this is H, such that this diagram commutes. That means such that this G is same as this F composed H, okay? So this H is unique. You can have... So whenever you have a map G from A to B such that G of S is unit for every S in S, then we actually have a ring uh, homomorphism, unique ring homomorphism from B to S inverse A. Okay. So whenever you have a uh, ring homomorphism from A to B satisfying this condition, then we have a ring homomorphism from B to S inverse A. Okay. <clears throat> Fine. So defining this one is not a difficult one, right? You, one can check that uh, we want to define H h from where to where s inverse a to b such that this diagram commutants so, right so how one can define so if you take any element in s inverse a it is of the form a by s right so somehow we have to define what is meant by h of a by s it should be definitely an element of b right so clearly a is here so you can talk about this as g of a right and s uh, so because for every S in S, G of S is a unit, so G of S inverse makes sense, right? So this we can define as G of S inverse, right? So therefore, uh, both are elements of B, so it belongs to this. This is the idea and it is a natural way of doing. Okay, now show that this uh, remaining all are easy, showing that H is well defined. What is meant by saying that H is well defined? So whenever you have two elements he are equal here, so they should be equal here also. Okay, it is not a difficult one. You take two elements are equal, then what is meant by these two equivalence class are equal, there exists some T satisfying this, then using the fact that G is a ring homomorphism, you uh, simplify this, right? And for every uh, S in S, this is an element, is, is a unit, so G of T is unit, so you can take out that, what is remaining is this, again simplify, okay? You will get that H of A by S is same as A prime by S prime, okay? So that shows that H... Uh, this whatever we are having here, here this is not here. There is a spelling mistake. This is same as H of A prime of S prime. Okay, so therefore this H is well defined, and it is also ring homomorphism. You can check that it is not a difficult one. And H composed F is G. Why this one? Because H of F F is defined on A. So H composed F of A is H of F of A, but F of A is A upon one. H of A by one is G of A into G of one inverse, but G is a homomorphism, so G of one is one and four, right? Now, uh, you can also check that this H is unique. That means if at all there is a H prime, okay, from S inverse A to B, satisfying that condition, that means composition, then H and H prime actually are same, okay? That is not a difficult one. By using this H prime composed F and H composed F, if they are equal to G, then they are actually equal here, right? That means they agree on, if you take any A, then H prime of A by 1 is actually same as this G of A. Okay, so you can check that this is true for every A in A. And what about H prime of 1 by S? You can write this as H prime of S by 1 inverse, but that is same as H prime of S by 1 inverse, but S is again in A, so therefore this is same as G of S inverse, right? That means H prime of A by S, because any element, general element in S inverse A is of this form. So H prime of A by S, because H prime is a homomorphism, this you can write as A by 1 into 1 by S, right? This is same as H prime of A by 1, H prime of 1 by S. But these two values we know, we have just calculated, this is same as G of A into G of S inverse. But this is precisely H of A by S. That shows that H prime and H are actually same, so there is only one map, unique map satisfying this condition right now let's observe some other properties of this ring s inverse a and this map okay what it is that you have f from a to s inverse a sending a to a by 1 simply right okay now you can observe that whenever s is 
an element here then f of s is a unit right why because f of s is s by 1 so you can easily check that f of s into 1 by s is actually 1 right okay then you can write this as 1 upon 1 if you necessary okay so clearly f of s for every s in s is a unit in s inverse a and if at all f of a is going to 0 then you can check that there exists some s such that a times s is 0 it is again it follows simply this and what is the third property that every element of s inverse a any element here is actually of the form even though they are of this form this equivalence classes but you can write f of a into f of s inverse for some for a belongs to a and s belongs to s right and this is also not difficult because any element here is of the form a by s right this you can write in this way and uh, a by 1 into 1 by s you can write this okay so wh what you have here is this a s inverse a and this f maps from a to s inverse a have these three following properties just now we have seen that for every s this f of s is a unit okay and second one is what we have seen is that whenever f of a is 0 then there exists some s such that a times s is 0 and third one is every element of s inverse a is of the form f of a into f of s inverse right for some a in a and yeah, s in s uh, what we can see is that if at all any g okay that means if any function satisfies from a to b if g is a homomorphism from a to b satisfying these conditions then uh, that b is isomorphic to s inverse a so in the other words if you have any ring if you have any ring here okay satisfying these conditions then b and s inverse a are isomorphic okay that is if g is from a to b is a ring homomorphism satisfying these three conditions then there exists uh, isomorphism unique isomorphism from s inverse a to b okay of course this uh, this h is equal to g is equal to h composed f right ah, so you what we have here is we have this a to s inverse a this is f and a to b is given to be this g where such that g of s is unit so therefore the first result which we have proved there exists some h from here to here right unique h which is a ring homomorphism. So what we want to show is that it is actually an isomorphism. Okay. So that map is already there. We want to show it is 1, 1 and R2. Uh, showing 1, 1 and R2 is not at all difficult one. Uh, using the second condition and third condition, you can show that using third condition, you can show that it is surjective. Okay. And using second condition, you can show that it is injective. Okay. So those proofs are not at all difficult. I can easily skip that. Uh, now, we will see some example and which we will see later on cases. Suppose you take P is a prime ideal. Okay. Then the, uh, you take S as this A minus P. Okay. Then this S inverse A, which also you can write as, this also you can write as A P, it is actually a local ring. That is the statement. Okay. So when you take uh, prime ideal, then when you localize it, it is actually a local ring. That means what is meant by local ring? It should have a unique maximal ideal. So it should have a unique maximal ideal. So that we will say it is a uh, localization of this A at prime ideal P. So first we will show that it has a unique uh, maximal ideal, right? So I will show that this S inverse A R A P has a unique maximal ideal. You take P is a prime ideal and take S is equal to A minus P. Then you can check that this S is a uh, clearly multiplicatively closed set. That means one should be there and it should be closed with respect to multiplication. And that is clear because one is not there in prime ideal. So therefore one has to be there in S. And similarly, if A and B are in S, then obviously A and B are not in P, right? Because they are disjoint. Okay. So, and P is a prime ideal. So therefore AP is not in, AB is not in P that shows that AB is in S. Okay, so clearly S is a multiplicatively close. Now, what is our uh, ideal we are going to consider maximal ideal is that this A upon S. So, take your M is A by S where A is in P, okay, and S is in S. So, uh, whatever numerator is there, it is an element of P 
and denominator is an element of s that means it is not an element of p okay right that is our m then you can easily check that it is an ideal okay uh, you can take it as exercise show that m is an ideal right it is that means take two elements right then uh, show that their addition or difference is there okay and take an element here and take an element of that ap right so that it is uh, product is again in m i'll leave that if you have any difficulty you can ask okay now we show that uh, to show it is a unique maximal ideal what we will show that it contains all non units okay so that means if you say some element is not in m then we show that okay it is actually a unit that means it contains all non units right if we prove this claim then it shows that it contains all non units so therefore it is the unique maximal ideal possible okay fine so suppose take b by t is not in m then what is the case if b by t is not in m that shows that b is not in p so therefore b is in s right that means b by t is a unit because you can write b by t times t by p is 1 upon 1 okay so therefore uh, if it is outside this then it is a unit that shows that it is a it contains all non units hence it is the only maximal ideal because whatever you are proving here it shows that if e is any ideal in n and if it is not contained right then there exist here which is not there therefore it is a if it is not here means it is unit so once units there is there in ideal then it is the whole right okay as i said the process from going from a to ap is called localization Okay, we will see some properties later. Also, you can observe that S inverse A contains 0 only if it is the 0 ring. Okay, it is the 0 ring if and only if 0 contain, 0 is there in S. That means in your multiplicatively closed set, 0 is there, then S inverse A is actually a 0 element. Okay, 0 ring. Uh, proof is not difficult one. And if you take any element, uh, say F or A, whatever you use it, okay, then if you take this one f all positive powers it is actually a multiplicatively closed set okay that you can simply denote by af yeah remember f is not a function it is simply an element if you have any difficulty you can simply use this a belongs to a then one a a square it is a multiplicatively closed set this you can denote by a okay right and also if you have i is an ideal okay and s is a multiplicatively closed set then 1 plus uh, this i okay uh, this s 1 plus this if you call it as s then you can check that it is actually a multiplicatively closed set that means for any ideal if you write 1 plus i then it will become a multiplicatively closed set right these are the uh, some of the properties of this ring of fractions okay so this you try to uh, prove it it is very simple but try to prove it this is about ring of fractions okay s inverse a so how it look like is a upon s where a is in a and s is in s right and we have seen some properties and so on uh, in next class what we'll see is uh, so in next class we'll see what is meant by uh, module of fractions module of fractions okay so just like how you have a module then how we can go uh, in terms of fractions and so on it is just like similar to this and we'll see some properties of it okay we'll stop here